When you try to answer the question, when am I done in selecting new cases over and over again, working iteratively between data and theory, the magical word is theoretical saturation. Now, what is this theoretical saturation? According to Glaser and Strauss in their work on the discovery of grounded theory, they say theoretical saturation is this. The criterion for judging when to stop sampling the different groups pertinent to a category is the category's theoretical saturation. It means that when your concepts, your theoretical concepts, are filled, this is called theoretical saturation. Well, how do you do this? Theoretical saturation means that no additional data are being found whereby the sociologist can develop properties of a category. So concepts, categories cannot be filled with any more new data. And the usual way of thinking about theoretical saturation is in three forms. And the first form is redundancy. All new data is redundant because there's no new information in it. That's the first form. The second form is more based on variation. And the third form is based on theory, theoretical, proper theoretical saturation, as some would say. As I said, the first form of sampling is based on redundancy. And it's a rather weak form uh, because new data do not lead to new information. Every new case adds no more to the old cases. Now that is when all the new information becomes redundant. And according to some authors, this is rather weak. Ian Day says, well, is this saturation or is it just sufficiency? And usually what I see is when people start getting bored with their data, when they start getting fed up with their data, it means that they are theoretically saturated. Now, a second form of theoretical saturation is variation sampling. And this is what is often used in applied research. In applied research, you have a very clear research question. And the research question is not to be discovered, but planned beforehand. So what you want to do is an answer. You want to have cases. You want to have types according to some variation. And usually people that use variation sampling, they do a qualitative survey. Not a survey that has to be representative to a population in percentages or in numbers of cases. No, but it has to be representative towards a population in variation. For instance, if you pose the question based on Alport's contact hypothesis that living next to migrants, for instance, give a more positive opinion on migrants in general, then you can use something like this. And what you do then is you try to fill each and every cell. So you, you talk to people with non-migrant neighbors that have a negative opinion, or you talk to people that live to non-migrant neighbors and have a positive opinion on migrants in general. You try to have the full range, not the percentages, of the population, not at all. You just want the range of possibilities. And this is called variation sampling. Now, the third form of sampling is more theory based. And to explain this, I would like to discuss an example of the expansion of Schiphol Airport about 20, 15 years ago. In the discussion about the expansion of Schiphol Airport, there were people in favor or against the runway. And it's a rather simple classification and rather simple categorization of groups of people. But if we try to nuance this slightly, we can put it in a cross table. And when we put it in this cross table, we can look at, okay, who were against this runway? Well, these were the people, for instance, within the nature organization and the the idea behind it was, well, we choose for the environment. So unfortunate for economy, but we choose environment. So it's bad for environment to have this runway. Now, obviously, the people at the airport had a totally different idea. We are in favor of the runway because we choose for economy. It's very uh, sorry for the people living around 
uh, Schiphol Airport that they get more noise or very sorry for nature and the environment, but we choose for economy. Now that's clear and that's very simple actually. Um, but is it enough? Well, if we put it in a property space like this and we add the dimensions, we can see we have two dimensions, one on economy, good or bad for the economy, and one on environment, good or bad for the environment. Now, theoretical sampling means that you not just focus on these two, but you start looking at other cells as well. So, when doing research, you have to look for people stating or cases stating that, okay, it's bad for economy, but it's also bad for environment. And there was a Green Party that said, well, we knew it, we need to have the runway at another airport. So, it's a little worse for economy and it's a little worse for environment, but not as bad as this idea or this idea. It's an alternative. Now, that's one example of cases in this cell. There are others, obviously, as well. This cell was more difficult because for this cell, someone had to argue that it was good for economy and good for environment. Now, when you do theoretical sampling and when you do theoretical saturation, you start looking especially for these cases because you want to see whether that is theoretically possible and then practically empirically possible as well. And obviously there were people that said something like this. The Minister of Transport said this new runway actually is an environment runway. It is good for the environment to have this runway because, because of this runway, the other runways have less traffic. So we can spread out pollution and it's good for the environment. That was the logic of the minister and actually people bought it. So what happened was she said it's good for, for the economy and it's good for the environment because we have a runway based on environmental ideas. Now, this shows that using theoretical saturation, you try to fill in categories and you try to link probably properties or property spaces uh, to it. Now, this is a, just an example of theoretical saturation. There are many more examples out there and hopefully you can find them yourself as well.